Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Steve Christian. For those of you who I have not had the opportunity to meet, um, I'm the Executive Vice President over Sales and Marketing here at Forelli, and we are excited as we uh, continue in our series of webinars to um, try and help the higher education community and do our part in uh, providing information that hopefully is uh, relevant and timely as we are all facing uh, a number of changes uh, to what our day-to-day -day lives look like uh, prior. So. Uh, before we get started and I turn it over to Kelly Sonicola, I wanted to kind of walk through a little bit of um, how we'd like the uh, presentation or the webinar to go today. Uh, please feel free to ask any questions within the chat window while Kelly is presenting, and you'll find a chat icon directly at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if you click that and bring it up, uh, you can type uh, any questions that you have real time, um, and we will certainly circle back to them if Kelly doesn't address them um, in moment. So we'll definitely circle back at the end if not. Uh, everyone has been muted at this point. If you could remain on mute uh, so that we can minimize uh, any additional sound or background noise. Um, and we know you may want to take notes um, and that is fine, but also know that we will be recording the webinar for your reference. So you will not only have the slides, but also the dialogue uh, to reference back to. So you can take notes, but just know you also have backup as well, okay? Um, thank you for that, and um, I'll turn it over to Kelly. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. Good morning, everybody. Um, normally, if I was presenting, I'd make everybody say good morning back, but Stephen muted you, so don't have that option. I am the Executive Vice President here over um, Elucian Colleague Professional Services um, and the CRM team, so hello to everybody I know. Um, hello to everybody I haven't met yet. I am going to apologize in advance as Stephen brings up our first poll. This is a very text heavy presentation, so not my favorite type of presentation to give, but it's financial aid. Anybody familiar with financial aid knows there's just a lot of words involved. Okay, people have started to fill out. If you could um, select what your ERP is so we know um, the base of the group we're speaking to. It looks like we have a, um, lucky for you, Kelly, we have a uh, heavily populated colleague group. Give everyone a couple more seconds to chime in. Okay. So it looks like we are at uh, almost 70% uh, colleague users, and then we've got 18% uh, banner, a few people soft, and then um, actually a couple of others. So a little pretty diverse group. Great. And we will cover some specifics in colleague as well as banner. And then if the others and the people softs uh, have any questions, we can research those as well. I just probably won't be able to answer those off the top of my head. So what we're covering today is the new financial aid implications due to the COVID-19 crisis. So who is this impacting? Everybody. Um, it's impacting K through 12, as well as four-year public universities, two-year public colleges, private nonprofit colleges, for-profit colleges, and borrowers as well are all impacted by the new CARES Act. <clears throat> so what is it? It's a $2 trillion emergency economic relief package of which uh, 30.75 billion is the education stabilization fund. And of that, uh, four, nearly 14 billion of that is designated for higher education emergency relief, known affectionately as HEERF, because again, financial aid, so it's a lot of words. Um, the timeline, the president declared a national emergency on Friday, March 13th. Um, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, the CARES Act, was signed into law on Friday, March 27th. The guidance currently from the Department of Education goes from March 5th to June 1st. Um, $6.28 billion was distributed on April 9th. And then the additional $6.2 billion was released this past Tuesday. In order to receive those funds, there are two certifications that schools have to fill out, and both of those have to be filled out to receive both halves of those funds. And those certifications indicate that 
the schools are affirming they'll distribute funds in accordance with the law that was signed um, by the president. So how were these funds allocated? 75% uh, of the money uh, was based on full-time equivalent Pell Grant recipients. Then 25%, a smaller portion, went to non-Pell Grant recipients. Students who were enrolled exclusively online were excluded completely from this calculation. Um, I know from the clients that I've worked with, sometimes that's a very difficult distinction to make, um, but it was based on iPads and FSA data that um, the federal government had at that time. So we know that 6.28 billion was distributed on April 9th and then the second half was distributed on Tuesday. Half of that must go directly to the students in the form of emergency financial aid grants for expenses. There's still a lot of discussion and guidance being given from NASPA and the Department of Ed on how and when these should be distributed. Um, they have to cover eligible expenses that are included in the student's cost of attendance. 50% can go to the institutions for crisis related expenses. This can include lost revenue, reimbursement for expenses that were already incurred, technology costs for starting these online programs when if they didn't have that infrastructure in place before, faculty and staff training to help them through this modality change, and payroll. I added as of right now, uh, last night as I was updating this presentation based on the new guidance that's been coming out all week from the changes that were released on Tuesday. So one of the more recent changes is funds are only available for Title IV eligible students. This is a change as of this week. The previous guidance didn't think that there was a Title IV requirement. What this means is that students, just from a practicality perspective, have to have filled out a FAFSA. Uh, students enrolled exclusively in online programs as of March 13th when it was signed into law are not eligible for any of the emergency grants. Institutions may not reimburse themselves for tuition of room and board refunds. So if you did have to provide refunds based on the time um, where the students were sent home, that's not something you can give back to the institution. These funds can also not be used to cover any outstanding balances, which uh, brings about some interesting uh, decisions when we're setting these up in our, in our student systems. The funds must be dispersed directly to the students in the form of an ACH or a check or a prepaid debit card. And schools are required to report 30 days after their signature affirming the certificate that I talked about earlier, those two certificates that affirm that you're going to distribute these funds um, in accordance with the law. And then every 45 days thereafter on how the grants were distributed, just to add complexity. Um, I love that it's 30 and 45, because that's how all of our calendars work. Now there's also further impact on federal work study and FSEOG monies. Um, schools may continue to pay federal work study wages where students began their work study jobs prior to the emergency declaration. And so that happened on March 13th. Um, this is the same uh, in a regular term situation as well. If a student never began attendance, they cannot receive federal work study money, so you can't disperse those funds still. Uh, schools are not required to provide an institutional share for any FWS, uh, so federal work study or FSEOG awards, for the 1920 or the 2021 year, unless they're a third-party private for-profit organization that employs students in an off-campus agreement. Again, some difficulty there when you're trying to implement something in a system because of all these different exceptions. Now, because there's work study that can't be spent or may not be spent, institutions are given the purview to transfer up to 100% of that unexpended allocation to FSEOG. You can then disperse these FSEOG funds for emergency financial aid grants. So this can be a grant for unreimbursed study abroad costs if a study abroad was canceled and they had to come home, uh, transportation costs, unreimbursed housing costs due to relocation. So this is for any off-campus housing, meal and board costs for those students having to leave campus, and expenses that would have been paid with lost wages. Uh, there is some guidance right now coming out from NASPA on these emergency uh, FA grants under the FSEOG guidelines. Um, so there's 
they're still straightening out if these awards have to go through Title IV students or not. Um, but with the change in guidance on Tuesday, that's still up in the air. There is also impact on Title IV. Um, and this was something we talked about briefly in the April 9th webinar. Um, it doesn't provide a blanket waiver of return to Title IV requirements. This means you still have to perform those calculations for any student that withdrew, whether it's a COVID-19 reason or not. What it does do, however, is it waives the requirement for schools to return those funds as a result of the R2T4 calculation. So when you go through it, the student has withdrawn, you figure out how much money should have gone back, you no longer have to release those funds. This includes all direct loans that have been awarded to students. Um, and then if you do have to do any housing or tuition refunds, it doesn't require a reevaluation re of the student's cost of attendance. So that's a, not a Department of Ed requirement. It may be a requirement based on your own institutional policy. So that's an institutional decision. Of course, there's also impact on um, satisfactory academic progress. So there's been changes to those calculations. Um, you're given the option of excluding any attempted credits that were not completed as a result of a qualifying emergency like COVID-19. Um, and you can remove that from the quantitative component without an SAP appeal. Um, there's no waiver of qualitative grades and additional guidance is going to come out from NASFA. This is all really fresh and they're still looking at the guidance um, from the DOE to make a NASFA recommendation. There's also been an impact on borrowers. All federally held student loan interest rates have been set to 0% for the next six months. Borrowers can also defer payments for six months. And then federal wage garnishments for anybody in default has been stopped uh, during this period of time. So the next question is how. Uh, so you have to disperse out money from the CARES grant through your systems directly to the students in the form of an ACH check or a prepaid debit card. And so, so far schools are employing a few main strategies. One is a formula that automatically divides the money among the students. So they're going through creating an algorithm and figuring out how to divide it up. Uh, some schools are requiring students to apply for funds by explaining their need and giving a justification. And then some schools are employing a combination of the two strategies above where they have to apply, but then there's an algorithm that comes into play afterwards. So our next poll, if you've discussed this institutionally, where does your institution fall with the strategies that I mentioned in the slide before? And if you do respond with something different, I'd love to hear what that strategy is in the chat. Certainly, yeah, it's kind of spread right now. Give folks a little bit more time. Okay. Pretty even split. Yeah, I was gonna say it's Pretty close. All right. I'm going to end the poll and we'll take a look at some of the chat as well. So just by a little bit, it says a combination of two of the strategies, Kelly. So people seem to be doing a little bit of a mix right behind that is uh, actually having students apply. Great. And I know some schools are trying to figure out right now with the new guidance that was issued this week what that means for the students that they'd already promised money to because that Title IV restriction does change uh, some things institutionally. Okay, so we're going to go through some technical approaches for how to implement this on your system. Um, the uh, Lucian has actually released guidance on the colleague and the banner systems on how best to handle this. There are some considerations as you're figuring out which strategy you are going to go with um, because again there's a lot of things that are still coming out as recently as Tuesday. Um, it was funny when we were scheduling this session we scheduled it so far out because we thought by this time everything would sort of be decided. We should have known better with financial aid, right? 
Um, so we can either choose to add a grant to the student's account through the financial aid modules and colleague or banner, apply a cash receipt um, on the colleague or the banner system, apply a miscellaneous credit invoice, and I updated the slide and that should say colleague instead of banner, and then generate an accounts payable invoice in the banner system. So I'm going to go over the colleague specifics first. So the first thing that you have to do, no matter what uh, approach you decide on, is set up steps for the refund. And so there's some configuration that has to occur in your colleague system. The first thing is creating a, a new AR type on ARTF. Uh, you probably, just for reporting reasons, want to create a new GL account for this non-AR code. And so you can do that on the GLAA screen in the colleague financials module, and then tie that to that AR type on the ARTF screen. Uh, you also then have to update the GL security for the new account so that everybody can post to it that needs to. And then depending on where you are in your transition from web advisor to self-service, you either have to update your STWP screen, which will detail into the financial web parameters to include that AR type so students can see it, or update the self-service finance page on SFPP to include the AR type. Then you also want to create a refund reason to be used on the voucher when you issue those refunds and core, the core val screen, um, and that's the refund.reasons table. And again, I apologize for the text heavy slides. And then you can create a new non-AR code, a NARD code on the NARD screen. And so if you decide that you want to update this through financial aid, uh, keep in mind with the 1098T changes, there are some um, regulatory things to keep in mind. So that's also why we're encouraging everyone to set up these new specific codes for the COVID-19 CARES Act purposes. And so you wanna create a new award category. Um, this is the ACD screen. It's not a screen that we go to frequently because we don't have a lot of award uh, category changes. And then we want to add a new award code for the CARES Act on AWD. This is going to be a destination one fund, which means it's an account receivable um, type of destination award. We, on the need cost EFC field, we want to make sure that E is set to exclude it from the budget. We want to use the GL count um, if we created a new one or if we have one that we specifically want to tie to this award. The AR type that we just created in the last screen we want to set the fund budget, so whatever your fund budget is for your institution based on the um, allocations you are given. And then for award el eligibility, you want to set uh, no to the global field. Then you want to make sure that your financial aid self-service screen or your web advisor STWP screen with those detail buttons is set to include that award code on your financial aid setup so the students can view it. Then what you wanna do is identify the students that need this award, so that's gonna be based on your approach, whether you decide to have them apply or automatically um, allocate them. And then you wanna batch award the students on the BAWD screen. Transmit the awards to the student receivable on FATR. And on FATR, since you did set up a new award code, you can put that in so you make sure that you're only transmitting that new award code um, for this FATR session. Then you'd want to run FATP, of course. If you don't want to put it in financial aid, and again, this is going to be, the guidance is still really fresh on this, so we don't know yet how it's going to be handled for 1098T season. So another option is to apply a cash receipt. Uh, for that, you'd want to create a separate distribution code. This is to keep everything separate, so in case we have to report on it down the road. And that's on the DIST screen. You want to make sure that it's associated with the cash GL account um, that's associated to your refund check bank account um, that you use for refunding. Then you also want to create a new payment method on PMTH. Identify students based on approach. Um, so whether you're having them apply or automatically distributing and create a save list. And then you can use ELF to import cash receipts. Um, if you need any help on this, feel free to uh, put your contact information in the chat and we can follow up. Then close and reconcile the cashiering session once all of those cash receipts are imported into the system through SEMA and post the transactions to the GL using the Siglip and Piglet screens. 
So we've handled an award through financial aid or a cash receipt, and now we could also do a miscellaneous credit invoice. And so for that, we would set up a new AR code on ARCF and associate it to a new GL revenue account number. Uh, those again are set up on GLAA on the financial side. You can add your AR code to your self-service app on SFCM, and that's just so it shows up on self-service if the student is viewing it. Identify students again in a save list. You're gonna have to create a save list one way or another. <laughs> and then create the credit invoices through um, MISB, or there's also the option of importing using ELF. Again, if you need help on that, feel free to put your contact information in the chat and we can follow up afterwards. Then you wanna post your transactions using your normal processes of Iglip and Piglet. So now the student has a credit either from a financial aid grant, um, a cash receipt, or a miscellaneous credit invoice. So you wanna uh, create the refund voucher through RFBR and RFBC. You wanna make sure you're using your new AR type that you set up a couple screens ago and your new refund reason. And then you have to pay the voucher through your normal um, check processing. Now, one thing to note with either the colleague side or the banner side, this is going to require, as you can tell, assistance from your bursar's office, from your financial aid office, and from your, um, from your finance office as well. So everybody has to work together to test this process and make sure that it works for your institution. And since you know that you have to be reporting 30, 30 days and then 45 days thereafter, you wanna make sure that you can get accurate information out of the system to report. So we're going to go through the banner specifics next. Um, again, very similar approaches where you can apply a fund. And so you'd set up a new fund code on, you know, the nice banner, longer mnemonics, RFR base or RFR management, and set the fund to reduce need. Um, again, the guidance on this is very new. So there are mixed guidances on if a fund is the right way to approach this on the banner system. You want to build a new detail code on TSADETC, set up the budget components, then manually assign or batch post the budget increase to offset the award. And this is so none of those funds are applied to any outstanding balances. And manually award or batch post the fund. Then when you're setting up, um, if you decide that you want to go a payment method instead, you have to decide if you want to use a unique term code to keep all of these payments together. If you decide to go the fund route in Banner, uh, a unique term code is not an option. And the note on colleague, a unique um, financial aid period, uh, award period is also not an option. You want to establish your new payment detail codes on Focal. Uh, you want to make sure it's that's refundable because that's the name of this game. The goal is to refund the student. And it should have a unique priority to ensure the payment does not apply to outstanding balances. So this is something that you'll have to add in addition in your configurations to set up a brand new priority code that isn't used for anything else. Then you're going to want to track these. Again, for reporting purposes, we don't know what the uh, long-term implications of this fund are. So you, want, you can track it in either user-defined fields, comments, or in tracking requirements. You also have the, uh, and then you can manually entry, um, manually enter payments either on the TSA mass, TSA detail, or TSA uh, rev screen of banner. You also have the option of uploading the transactions via the TB receivable API. So again, just like in colleague, you have now a refund. Um, a credit balance to refund. So you'd have to go through and process those refunds using a new refund detail code that you'll set up on the system. You wanna make sure that refund code is set to Y. You can temporarily set the title for detail code. And this is something that you'll wanna remove after you've um, completed your CARES Act funding. Then you're going to apply those payments. Um, make sure that all of your normal refunding that you're doing anyway is already done and you're handling this in a separate session. And then you can run the refund process with the new refund detail code you created earlier. You'll apply those payments and finalize the session and feed to finance. 
You also have an option in Banner that you don't have in Colleague, which is to generate an accounts payable invoice directly um, in the AP side. You'd establish a FOPL to assign to the AP invoice and process it as a regular invoice using FOPL and then upload those invoices. Um, then the records can be loaded directly uh, and created. So as you're figuring out what process you're going to adopt, you have to think about how are you going to track your FWS wages. There are considerations. Um, you can continue to pay FWS if students are working from home. You can continue to pay FWS if they were had a set job to do. That is the option of the institution, but those wages still have to be tracked, um, just as if it were a normal situation and not in an emergency situation. We also know that you have to track the CARES Act disbursements. This has to include the student, how much the student was given, and how that amount was determined. So you have to make sure you're keeping track of that for every student, uh, every student no matter what your approach is. And you have to send it out 30 days and every 45 days thereafter. So the date of disbursement and the date of report is going to be important to track as well. The 1098T impact, as we know, we've gone through some difficult 1098T years the past couple of years. So we are still waiting on guidance from the Department of Ed and NASFA on how this is going to impact 1098Ts moving forward and how these funds will be considered. As far as resources, the uh, Lucian uh, Okta hub page has a COVID-19 area uh, where people are chiming in with how they're approaching um, setting up the system for Banner Colleague. NASFA is being constantly updated. They have removed their paywall, so if you're not a member, you can still access the resources and see um, all of the questions that have been posted and what has currently been resolved and not resolved. Most recently on Tuesday, um, I highlight that link because uh, that's when the Title IV guidance came out, um, which changed a lot of the impact there. And then there's uh, the Department of Education website that's constantly being updated as well with guidance from them on how these CARES Act funds should be dispersed. And so that was a very text heavy um, presentation. So if you have any questions, I see the chat window lighting up. Oh yeah, no, that was uh, good information, Kelly. I believe we've got, we've sparked a lot of questions. I'm trying to scroll back up and make sure we don't miss any. Um, okay, the first one is, oh, am I missing? Okay, um, how long do we pay the Fed CWS students? If the spring FCWS student is uh, registered for summer, do we continue to pay the student even though the staff are working off campus? Now, and Mallory, that's an institutional decision. Um, so the guidance so far from NASFA is that as long as you're tracking those federal work study wages, um, it is an institutional decision on if they continue to pay out. There is, uh, that guidance is getting updated every day on the NASFA website, so I'd encourage you to check that out. Okay, I have one more for Mallory while we're there. Are R2T4 funds not returned for all students or just those who are affected by COVID? The, I don't wanna misspeak, so, because uh, those uh, just changed on Tuesday, so I will send a follow-up to you, Mallory. Okay, Mallory, any other context you wanted to add there if you wanted to pop off mute? Did we answer questions or is there context to that? Thank question? you, that's it. Okay, thanks so much. Um, let's see. Um, if it's just a refund, why even display this AR type in WA or SS? Uh, I'm sorry, Stephen, could you repeat that question? If it's just a refund, why even display this AR type in WA or SS? That was from uh, V Mall. So. Hi, Verlin. Um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so some schools are uh, choosing to display that information. It's really to reduce calls to the office. Um, and they can see that then in their statement um, in WebAdvisor self-service, depending on how far you've migrated. So it's just more for notation and to reduce questions. Uh, there's also um, some implications for using, you know, colleague communications management or um, banner communications 
just so you're letting the student know where they are, especially if you have an application process, then you also have further documentation on when you communicate to that student located right in the ERP. Okay, does that answer your question? Was there any other context to that, Roland? Nope, thanks. Okay. Um, next question is, how are schools accounting for COA and EFA for these? Uh, do we have to take into account students' current COA when awarding the HEERF grant? Uh, this seems to be a gray area in the guidance. For example, a uh, student who has no room left for COA for 1920, are they eligible for any of the funds? There is some very, very recent guidance, I think it was released even possibly last night, that indicates you can award over COA for these funds. So if they have no room left, but there's still, um, I don't like to use the word need when I'm talking about financial aid because that has its own definition, but uh, you are allowed to award over COA. And that is very recent guidance that was released, uh, I believe yesterday. Great. Um, next question. It wasn't a question, it was more of a statement. Um, uh, BAWD bought is great for uh, the students who are getting all the same amount. If different amounts um, for the students, you may need a different approach. And I don't know if Donna Lynn wanted to provide some context for that, if there's something. Well, and um, she's, she's absolutely correct. That's mm -hmm. um, the great part about MISB and BAWD is they're super great if the students are all getting the same amount. Um, if you are awarding different amounts, whether it's through an algorithm or some other approach, then uploading cash receipts using ELF or even uploading credit invoices using ELF would probably be a better approach because you can uh, indicate different amounts. Okay, well, thank you for sharing that. Um, we are a colleague school and we are uh, thinking of doing this through accounts payable. Is there a reason we wouldn't want to do that? Uh, Jonathan, for uh, my concern on accounts payable is then how are you going to connect it to each um, individual student? Ultimately, if you do a refund, a, a voucher, and then it would be ultimately processed through accounts payable, but there's a connector then that exists um, in the database between that voucher and, you know, whatever refund method that you created. So for all of the reporting and all of the reporting requirements that we don't even know about yet, I would encourage you to start in the student module and work your way forward. Okay. Kelly, can I just jump in on that for of one? Of course. Second? Our concern is we have some students that are still carrying balances, and I know mm -hmm. that we have to get the money to them. Yes. So we would then have to do it as an advance for that student, correct? No, if you set up the new AR type on ARTF, um, since that is a separate AR type, it doesn't look at any of the other outstanding balances on your student or your other receivables. Okay, so we would just do it as a separate AR type and run it entirely through there, but then it would still go to the, the student's refund option that's in the system. Exactly. And so when you're running RFBR and RFBC, since you're only looking at that single AR type, if the student had an outstanding balance before, it wouldn't be applied. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Altarn, I don't know if this was a question. Um, in the campus, hypo uh, hypothetically, Hypothetically, campus, and there is all new stuff, and only IT is present um, and has to share this information. If things are not done correctly, will there be penalties down the road? So I guess the question is about penalties for correctly doing this, Kelly. <laughs> and Russ, speaking anecdotally, um, it's reminding me at least a lot about gainful, uh, when they first implemented gainful employment reporting, um, and there is a lot of uh, the guidance was changing every day and you didn't know how to report it. We didn't know how it was going to be set up or configured. Uh, and we're only starting to see the implications of gainful employment being set up incorrectly. So I think it's going to be a very difficult process to audit. So the more you can document, the better. And, um, and I agree, it's going to be very tricky considering all of the different modules that it touches. And like I said, it's going to require coordination between the bursar's office and finance and financial aid. And then, you know, IT is always involved in everything, so we get pulled in too. Okay. 
Um, this one was going back to the COA question. The Department of Education has made it clear that the HEERF funds are not to be counted as EFA. And that was Janae who had provided that. Mm -hmm. um, is there any recommendation about posting term or non-term? We need to keep this money uh, from paying balances. Right, and that's uh, precisely the reason, um, like I was speaking with Jonathan about, to set up the new AR type, uh, and that's just to keep those monies separate. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I don't know if, I believe you're a colleague school, if I'm not remembering the name incorrectly. Um, and so that's why you'd want to set up a new AR type and run your refunds only through that AR type, and it won't look at the student's overall outstanding balance. Okay. Uh, next question I got was, can these funds be given to students who had completely uh, withdrew from the school uh, due to COVID circumstances? I'm sorry, can you repeat that one? Can uh, funds be given to students who completely withdrew uh, due to COVID-19 circumstances? As long as they... Uh, it depends on your your refund policies, but as long as they had cost of attendance expenses incurred during the spring 2020 semester, during the period of emergency, <laughs> then they're able to receive CARES Act funds. So a lot of if, 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 if. Okay. Does that answer your question, Thomas? Is there any other context to that? No, that answers it. Thank you. Okay. NASFA has indicated, uh, NASFA has indicated that we are not permitted to give across the board awards to students unless we can document the expenses students have incurred, such as nursing students who have courses moved online and now to get specific software for their course. Any thoughts on that, Kelly? Move that line and now well, and that's um, some of the guidance that was released on Tuesday, which was sort of contradictory to original guidance, which was it has to be applied to cost of attendance or additional costs. So if a student was completely online and not moving, even though those students are affected by COVID-19 too, that was the assumption of institutions, they aren't eligible for those funds. Um, so, you know, it has to be linked to cost of attendance and you, it has to be documented. Okay. Um, uh, effective the last pay cycle for FWS students, uh, they were all furloughed or laid off. Um, does this have an effect? Uh, and Russ, that's an institutional decision on how you want to award federal work study moving forward. Um, so if you laid them all off and furloughed them, then um, you would just, the institution has the option then of moving that unexpended FWS aid to FSEOG. So you have an option there, um, but it would be an institutional decision on whether to furlough or lay off those student employees. Okay. Um, and yes, I want to confirm, I wrote it in the chat and talked about it at the beginning of the presentation. Slides will certainly be available. Uh, the webinar uh, will be sent out to you, so you will have that to reference back to. Um, okay. Um, Crystal had something, and uh, Kelly, I don't know if you're reading that, she had just... Uh, read expense versus need. HERF student share dollars um, are to aid students for expenses related to disruption of campus operations due to the coronavirus. This is different than a change in students' financial need due to COVID-19, which could result in loss of income uh, rather than new expenses, meaning that we can't award half funds. Our HEER F funds. Higher um, education if, emergency relief funds. Yeah, exactly. Like words. <laughs> um, uh, funds if campus is all, or excuse me, if the campus student needs funds for housing because housing would not have been impacted by the disruption of the campus operations. That's a lot to take in. <laughs> right. So um, they would need to have a documented budget component for housing, on-campus housing, in order to give them 
Campus Act funds for housing because uh, if they were living off campus already, uh, they wouldn't have lost that because they haven't been uh, moved off campus. Okay. Um, we're looking to make the uh, webinar available as soon as possible. So I would say uh, tomorrow, we'll definitely get that out to everyone, if not later today. We're getting better uh, at publishing these. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get moving, quicker. Moving quicker, quickly. Um, uh, just, again, back to housing, Kathy was saying housing is, can be affected for an off-campus student. Is, new is there new guidance from the ED? And I would say, Kathy, that these, um, the guidance from the ED and the guidance from NASPA is literally changing every day. Um, I was watching updates last night. Uh, so the housing argument is, is a sticky one still. Okay. Um, lastly, I see Tanya uh, wrote, does the award amount have to be different for every student? It's, it's a really based on your justification um, of how those awards are being. Uh, so I think it would depend on your, your registration rate tables, what your tuition and fees are set up as, what your need requirements are. There's a lot of factors that go into that. Um, personally, I, I have a hard time coming up with a scenario where everybody has the same amount, uh, Tanya, but it might just be my imagination. <laughs> Okay, those are all the chat questions. Were there any additional questions? Anyone that wanted to pop into chat or come off of mute and ask now? Okay, uh, well, we certainly want to thank everyone for joining. We will uh, work to get the uh, webinar out to everyone um, as quickly as possible. We'll try and get that out uh, later today. If not, it'll be sometime early tomorrow morning. Uh, we will be uh, hosting additional webinars, uh, again, with hopefully timely and prompt information as we're all um, trying to navigate through uh, our new normal. Um, and you could always check out uh, forelli.com uh, and see what's happening with what's new. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. And if you have any ideas for future webinars, feel free to hit us up at info at or on the 888 line. Um, we'd love to hear from you.